look, a private investigator, I think people see as like this clandestine, I'm in a car yeah. somewhere following people. I, I, we're professional researchers. And sometimes research involves being in a car on the side of the road undercover. Sometimes it means knowing who to ask, how to ask, and putting our name on it instead of the consumer's name. Licensed attorney, award-winning writer, businessman, entrepreneur, and other over-the-top crap, it's Life and Law with Eugene Sisko, Jr. You are here with another episode of uh, Life and Law, and I have a wonderful guest today. His name is Josh. He's a private investigator or a PI, as we call him in the business. Uh, being an attorney, I've had an occasion to uh, employ several of them. And I ran across his content on TikTok, and it is tr it, it's really, really good. He gets into a lot of uh, areas that are of, uh, seem to be some kind of little niche areas that are of popular concern now when it comes to bullying, cyberbullying, and uh, group bullying, or I, you'll tell me the, the official name of it. But anyway, I found your content absolutely fascinating. And so I wanted to bring you on to get uh, the viewers, you know, on our YouTube channel and our Spotify, uh, our podcast, to just try to get an idea of who you are, what you do, and the kind of work um, that you enjoy doing. You know, we, we do a lot of stuff. Some of it we enjoy, some of it we don't. So we're going to talk <laughs> yeah. about what you don't like and, and what you do like. So I'm going to give you the floor right now just for a little bit. And you tell me, first off, introduce yourself to everybody. Tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I really appreciate it. It's an honor being a guest on your show, Eugene. Um, so, you know, my name is Josh. I'm based out of Utah. Um, I am a private investigator. I'm licensed in Utah and also have some licensure in other states. Uh, a lot of my background, and it, just like how it may work with attorneys, different private investigators have different skill sets uh, that differ. Um, s some are better at uh, maybe civil cases. Some are better at working criminal cases, uh, contract cases, just like how there's a division in law. So my background is in financial crimes and um, open source intelligence. So just for people, cause I, I kinda know, what is open source intelligence? So that way then we kinda, if you don't mind, just kind of explain that a little bit, cause I'm not real sure about it. I kinda know, but so there might be some people out here that don't, that don't know what that specialty is or what that niche is. Absolutely, open source intelligence, it's often shortened to O-S-I-N-T, OSINT is sometimes what they'll call it for short. Uh, it is one of the branches of intelligence that you can use in an investigation. Some of the other ones involve in interviews like Humint, or maybe you see those people on TikTok who can tell you exactly where someone's located based on one photo. That's G-O-N-T, it's ge geographic intelligence. Oh, but okay. Open source intelligence is one specific branch. And what I utilize is public records. Um, I think there's, there's an, there's almost a community around open source intelligence. You have like Belling cat, cat, a lot of like, uh, armchair investigators that kind of get on and, and just use Google to death. I see it as a little bit more complicated than that when you're doing it professionally, open source intelligence. I need to make sure that my intelligence is uh, admissible in courts. So I can't just be pulling off of like random websites. I have to have foundation and basis. Um, so a, a lot of that is heavily focused on, Freedom of Information Act requests, which is when obviously we're filing a request to the government for their records or through, um, you know, home ownership records, court records. Old fashioned way of going to the courthouse and looking through the deed books and checking out mortgages and things of that nature, land and, and, and um, financial kind of records that are public records. In, in ways that a lot of people don't even realize are public. It, you know, I, I, an easy example is Florida, which I think is probably one of the most open books of all states for public records. You can look up how much someone's paying per month on their mortgage and to what bank they pay that mortgage payment. And then I can extrapolate from that and say, well, if you have your mortgage payment at this very large bank, it's very probable that you have your checking account there as well. So if you're looking to garnish, maybe we should subpoena there. You know, th th then we can start to build out investigative steps, 
it's it's really a great place to start and how I mentor a lot of investigators is starting in open source intelligence. So how did you get to decide? I always like to ask people this question. What was your aha moment? Like, this is what I want to do. How did you reach that conclusion? So um, at the when I first got into investigations, I actually was a life insurance salesman. And I had to take a training at one point for something called anti-money laundering. <laughs> and you, they, want you, they want you to avoid, you know, helping people break the law. Okay. And I learned that there was a whole department at the insurance company that literally what they do is they investigate money laundering concerns. Uh, and then they report to the Department of the Treasury. And I was like, that sounds really cool. And actually, coincidentally, at the same time, Goldman Sachs, a large investment bank, had just gotten in trouble. Uh, if you ever heard a billion dollar whale, yep, that that had just happened. <laughs> so they were looking to beef up their compliance department. So uh, I jumped into their AML anti money laundering AML program over there and got into financial crimes investigations. That term whale in the financial institution, you know, I've heard it more most recently in reference to our former president Donald Trump, who had criminal charges filed against him for supposedly they, they they were calling him a whale, meaning that they knew he was going to borrow a large sum of money and they were willingly a, wanting to give it to him and possibly maybe everyone in collusion inflate the value of some of his stuff, give him more money. And of course, he always apparently, according to the record, he paid things back, but that still they called him a whale. Yeah, you know, it's it's a really great metaphor because if you think about it, um, in, in the financial sector, if you have enough money to kind of float around like that, it's like a whale in a pool. You're making huge waves and splashes. It's affecting everyone around you, whether you like it or not. You're leaving a large footprint. So uh, it's, it's, it's a strong metaphor there. And I'll tell you, you know, a lot of a lot of the financial crimes investigations that were fruitful came out of real estate. Real estate is a troubled industry. So, well, I hear a lot of these people say, we're just again, not to derail you, but when they talk, because it garnered a lot, of, it still is garnering a lot of press. Is these financial people are saying everybody in real estate does that? Everybody. I mean, this dude was, he wasn't shy. He said, every now, I don't know if he was minimizing or carrying uh, President Trump's water. But I suspect being a lawyer, I've seen it happen. You, 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 you get your appraisal in and that appraisal kind of works for the bank, even though he's independent, he wants to get paid. And so he knows that if you get a loan, you know, it's just a whole circle of it. Everyone, everyone that I know puts $1 when they report to the DMV on a car sale. And everyone that I know is committing tax fraud. <laughs> Doesn't make it any more legal. <laughs> no. Right. But of course, you feel better about it. If my neighbor's doing it, then I guess I get some, some um, you might be able to say you get a little bit of, uh, you feel better if you do it because everybody else is doing it. I you know, work in substance. It can't arrest us all, right? right? I, I work in substance abuse and addiction, and that's always one of the things people will say, well, everybody does it. Well, I say, not everybody does it. Everybody you know does it. <laughs> Big difference. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so you were go back a little bit. You were uh, had this course which caused you piqued your interest, and so then after that, did you just kind of get you woke up two years later and you were what you're doing now, or was there just was that the moment where you said I want to be a private eye? So uh, when I was in investment banking. The standard of proof in the uh, investigations there is reasonable, articulable suspicion. So it's those cases can be kind of boring because you don't feel like you're really bottoming anything out. You're getting to a point of, man, this looks suspicious, and then you're passing it off to the Fed. Uh, you know, you, you don't really feel like you're producing anything except protecting the bank from liability, right? Which is, I'm not here to protect the corporations. Um, so, you know, I kind of started thinking about how I can monetize this. I didn't kind of go out on my own decide what cases I want to take and how far I want to take them. Um, and so I think it was, I was, I was already doing investigative work, but when I wanted to get my licensing, I think it was 2021, I reached out to a criminal defense firm, uh, kind of out of the blue. and was like, Hey, if you need someone who has a background in finance, I know that finance and legal, it's hard to get someone who has both. So uh, I'm happy to come in and assist with your white collar cases. And I was able to, 
convince them that I would be helpful in that matter. And I ended up getting started, got my license through them, uh, and got uh, started in criminal defense work. So you did what I always tell people to do. You get in a job and you do something and you look around and you say, well, shoot, I like this. I want to figure out how I can do it, control my own future and make my own money. Right. That's that exactly. Is, I mean, and that is the best way to find something to do that you want to do the rest of your life, whether it's to a hobby or maybe make it your your primary gig is just to find a place that you're happy at. And then I always tell people, you know, find what you like to do and then find a way to make money at it. I, it that's the best way to do it. So, so when you first started, did you when you first started as as a private a business owner, did you mostly work on the criminal end or were you working with divorces, uh, forensic uh, uh, kind of work when, you know, uh, property hunting down property? Because that's a big in my line of work, people get a divorce. It's finding assets is horrible. I mean, I was in a case where a guy paid a forensic accountant uh, around 15 grand to find uh, assets. Yeah, it's it's not easy. Um, well, I, you know, I wasn't doing it directly through the defense firm, but because I had licensing through them, I was able to somewhat operate independently. So I, I started, uh, you know, advertising and reaching out to other agencies to subcontract. And I was doing a lot of uh, divorce work, specifically assets, because um, it, it it's true. W there's almost a cliche that you have people who have a strong background in legal and people who have a strong background in finance and the overlap is can be tough, the nexus. So I was trying to, to meet that need in the market out here. Which is another is another good business principle find your, get your good skill set and find out where the need is. A hundred percent. And so I, I had a lot of success doing that. And um, of course, asset, tra asset tracing is huge with divorce. It's also huge with um, contract, uh, breach of contract, because those settlements can be large and you want to make sure that there's the ability to pay on judgment. And, and you know, you get a, my law professor said, <laughs> as my contract professor said uh, about, you know, those kind of things and, and contracts and breaches. He said, you know, if you're not careful, you're going to litigate and you're going to get a judgment that is suitable for framing <laughs> because you can't find the assets. A hundred percent. And so I, I've, I've been an expert witness in the district court out here um, specifically for that. We have, you know, oh, they're expecting the breach lawsuit, they start to form another company, they start moving IP over. Yeah, so that's it's a dirty business. And then that's when we're get, that's when we're getting to open source, you know, now I'm, I'm going into open source records to find the copyrights where are they where are they located, how are they being used, tracking down the website ownership, um, things like that. Now, just because uh, I've talked to you on the phone, we had a real good interview on the phone. Uh, you're a math if I remember correctly, you you are a math person. That's what I call math people because math is like a foreign language to me. So there are regular people, and then there's math people. So, <laughs> so is that your orientation, I guess, is, is in the mathematics and science field. Is that correct? Yes, I, I, I have my bachelor's in mathematics. So it was my whole background was um, math and research. And so... When you when you talk about getting down into the granular level and looking at these asset recoveries and trying to hunt this stuff down, that is in a way you're solving a math problem. Absolutely, and I felt like a lot of the the math concepts that I was studying in college, analysis, graph theory, a lot of that is just abstract concept. If you can take an abstract concept and kind of materialize in front of yourself, it makes these kinds of things a lot easier. And it, it's just crazy. And so you have, so I, so if, if someone looked at your skill set, they would say, I think I would say, and I think I might've said when we were talking math, you told me you were a math guy. And I'm like, how the, how the hell does math work with this? But you, in your brain, it makes perfect sense. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I felt like the background in math and it wasn't like, 
calculations. It was very abstract in geometry and in, in theory that you can sit down and you can talk about something abstract. And that's what a lot of law is. It's very abstract. It's very semantics and definitions. And how do you define this? And does it meet the standard? Yeah. And to be a good investigator, you have to understand how to within reason, interpret the law. Obviously, we're not attorneys, but you have to be able to sit there and be like, you know, reasonably looking at this, this is what's going to be helpful to the attorney is being able to meet these standards on the statute. And there's a lot of investigators that can't do that. So it's important to provide. No, and a lot of people, what they're doing, because I know of a couple and they're just too busy trying to, they're too busy trying to find an answer without really appreciating the process. If you don't have a good process, then it's not admissible in court. You got to have there the foundation you go. there. Exactly. Every step and, documented. And if, you, and if you don't appreciate the process and follow it, then you're going to come up to a wrong conclusion anyway. A hundred percent. Yeah. So good, good for you. So, so you've done, you followed all of this out. So how long have you been, um, I want to say more or less working for yourself? You know, I feel like that's always a hard thing to measure. I, doc I documented my hours. Um, not all of them will be recognized by the state of Utah because they have very strict standards of what constitutes an investigation. Oh. Um, <laughs> if it's not public sector or billable hours, basically, they're not going to recognize it, which is kind of ridiculous to me. That is weird. Uh, but um, I, I think my hour age right now is at 10,000 hours. So over the course of four or five years. That's yeah, ten thousand hours. You you look at I know if you're billing in a law firm, you're they want you to pump out about little in excess of, before you become a partner about two thousand twenty five hundred hours a year, which is hard to do. Yeah, well, th th those weren't all billable because I don't do billable hours because um, I feel like it just adds more administrative cost. <laughs> yeah, two thousand billable is hard to do because yeah. some things don't count. And yes, a lot of things don't count. That's just business ownership. Nothing counts. It's, it's, that's that's why I do everything. I, I do everything fixed now because I feel like billable just adds administrative cost that gets passed to the consumer anyway. And so you, if you had to guesstimate it, you're looking at you've been doing this for roughly five to six years, right? Yeah. If you had to put into uh, easy to understand terms, if someone was looking for you, what would be the what would be the things that they would need to find you for? So like services that I'm generally providing to people is what you're asking? Yes. Indirectly? Yes. Look, a private investigator, I think people see as like this clandestine, I'm in a car yeah. somewhere following people. I I we're professional researchers. And sometimes research involves being in a car on the side of the road undercover. Sometimes it means knowing who to ask, how to ask and putting our name on it instead of the consumer's name. So, you know, I have a lot of clients that it's probably something they could do themselves, but they, they're concerned about their name being on the record. And so I go in and ask on their behalf. Um, and private investigators, unlike the general public, at least in my state, it is it does depend on the state. We have a lot more leeway legally to stock. I hate the word stock, but the stock law in Utah exempts private investigators. Um, more or less, we're allowed to use tracking devices, and you're not. We're allowed to we're allowed to lie to people in a lot of in circumstances where maybe otherwise it would be fraud. But so, like a cop, like very similar to a cop. Um, of course, we don't have uh, immunity like cops do. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we yeah. have got really big uh, liability insurance. <laughs> yeah, uh, expensive insurance. But generally speaking, like a lot of things that cops can do we have some sort of parallel on the private side aside from warrants, but um, yeah. So basically if people want to figure something out, they can reach out and we, we, we consult. Um, honestly, if you, if you throw in a, my, my search engine optimization is pretty solid. I feel like if you throw in Josh private investigator, I'm going to come up anyway. So that would be like, again, we talked about earlier divorce actions, uh, trying to, collect on a judgment maybe is that what someone might want to engage you to do absolutely I, I you know those things tend to have like a very clear monetary game like you you're gonna want to pay a private investigator to do something that's going to be beneficial to you um so making sure you're, you're good on judgment before you go to court yeah. save you some money <laughs> if you're looking to yeah. tra track down assets 
but you know, there's there's a sentimental component. There, we've been hired to find long lost cousins, um, help people um, who find find uh, family members in other countries. So you've done that. You've tracked down individuals that had lost touch with their family and families worried about them. Absolutely. Uh, well, it's, it's more of like a, you know, it, it all starts with dad had a second family three generations back. And now there's some lost oh. cousins, like those kind of cliche, almost scenarios. Um, we, we will track them down. A lot of South America and Central America have public record systems that are very similar to the U S and I speak Spanish. So I help navigate those for our consumers. I'll be darned. So you've got, You've got, again, when I, I talk to people about their jobs and careers, the, the best asset you have is however many tools you can put in your tool belt. 100%. Makes you a lot more valuable, right? Definitely. But I, I, I definitely always encourage consumers because, you know, private investigators do cost money. Make sure it's something that, you know, you're paying us for the work and we're going to do as much as we can. We can't ever guarantee an outcome because we never know what's going to be under the rocks that we're searching. So if I if I had to ask you, so you, you mentioned money and cost. So it's and it's always good to know that up front. I always tell people because when they ask, I get calls. Uh, how much you charge for this? Like how much you charge for a divorce? Well, there is no one answer, and I exactly. I hate saying that to people because they think you're being a damn lawyer. <laughs> but but it it depends. It There's a lot of factors for me. Uh, are you going to argue as the other side cantankerous? Is the lawyer a pain in the ass? Um, you know, how long were you married? Is it going to be a agreed upon divorce? Is it going to be contentious? Are there kids involved? So the answer to that question is, is variable. And so in your situation, what could someone reasonably uh, expect to pay I guess you have a retainer, so that way you know you're not getting stiffed, at least on a lot of money. So you got a retainer. But what is your average fee if you um, looked at an hourly fee? Because my hourly fee is somewhere around 200 bucks an hour, um, it, give or take. A and so what would your average fee be or your uh, a fee that you might someone might expect to pay calculate in their head? Absolutely. You know, and, and I think in ways that a lot of people don't even realize being a private investigator, running a private in, private investigations agency parallels running a law firm in a lot of the same ways, a lot of the same issues and, and administrative concerns. Uh, it, it depends is kind of a cliche for us, too. I guess. Hey, you hate it. I mean, you feel like a scumbag when you say it. I always feel like when I say that someone's thinking you're getting ready to screw me. Well, the problem is the, 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 it, there's a lot of issues where, you know, I'm I'm the expert. So the consumer doesn't always know what I need to know. And sometimes they're going to withhold information because it's embarrassing or they think it's unhelpful. And then it ends up blowing up the case on the back end. Like, oh, well, <laughs> this is not this is going to be messy. But <laughs> and you, you have to have that come to Jesus yeah. talk right from mm -hmm. the beginning. And you, exactly. I tell my clients, listen, if you do not tell me everything, feel like I, I say, listen, this is like you're going to confession because if you leave something out on the back end, I did bankruptcies. That was so similar here. Bankruptcies, a lot of time people are afraid to tell you everything they have because they don't want the judge to take it from them. So I'm doing an initial interview. I've done this about three times. I had this happen where I'm not obligated to, to cross, -ex I'm cross examine my client. I want to ferret out what I can, but I'm not obligated to do a records check on them. And I'm not, I'm not obligated to go to the courthouse. I'm not obligated to do that. But there have been times when I have been surprised and go to the judge and the judge has found things that someone tried to hide from me. They immediately will tell me if you're Miss Cisco, if your client does not come clean, I will press charges against them. I'm like, Oh my God. And you're embarrassed. You know, you feel bad for your client. So they're trying to lie to you. And so you have to have that talk. Is that something similar to what you do with yours? Yes. And part of the talk for us, like our kryptonite is protection orders and uh, domestic violence. And people lie about that so often. And in Utah, what a lot of people don't realize is it's bilateral. So if you have a protection order against someone else, you can't, you really shouldn't shouldn't is probably a better word. You should be sending me out there to go follow your abuser around because they might interpret that as 
a counter violation and remove the protection order. So I'm like, I don't want to do that because I don't want to get it removed. And then you're blaming me after the fact. And now you're at risk of abuse. Oh, and, and which they will, you know, they're going to get mad at you for the a bad outcome anyway. A lot of times that's why you get that retainer. <laughs> yeah. That's why I try Yeah, exactly. I try to, you know, give a lot of prefacing, but um average case it, it's t I, I honestly i build differently depending on whether or not this is personal interest or relating to a, a lawsuit because with there's a lawsuit there's a lot more tracking that goes into it i got to make sure we have foundation for everything that i obtain there's more evidence um so you have to i don't want to say you have to do more diligence but you do have to prepare the case differently and that's true when i have a legal case come in my door i i calculate the amount of actual work that I'm going to have to do, because sometimes you get in the cases, you absolutely know there's going to be more work. Um, and so you, you've got to account for that. I think I, the way that I do it, it's hours. So I'll say to someone, this case will probably take me, if I do an appeal, I'm getting ready to do an appeal for somebody. An appeal costs me, take me about 40 hours. If I'm billing at $200 an hour, that's roughly what their fee is going to be. You know, if I do it at 30, you know, I might, might give them some money back. But but that's what I reasonably believe. And so that's what my retainer is going to be. And then I do build down on it now. I'll, I'll give them their money back. But but I'm, I've been doing this so long, I kind of know it. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of my fee. Hourly fee don't fluctuate. It's just the number of t hours that kind of fluctuates. Yeah. So for me, if I'm doing it like a personal interest case, I think the average cost is somewhere between – 500 and 750. I bill at 150 an hour um, for cases relating to uh, financial forensics. Uh, if people are asking about corporate, they want me doing a corporate investigation because they have a personal interest, um, <laughs> which does happen. Um, if, I, if I'm going to do it hourly, which I, I don't always do, it depends because um, Sometimes the way that those investigations track, it's a lot of 15 minute increments and instead of tracking every 15 minute increment. Um, let's just say I'm going to take this to the end for 500. It's probably going to take me three to four hours, which is about what it's going to come out to. So there's some wiggle room there, but I won't charge you any more than that. Um, when, it's, when we're talking about legal cases, when I'm working with counsel on divorces or uh, more frequently in my background has been felony charges with like aggravated or challenging the aggravated component or, or trying to track down uh, assets, um, I charge 150 an hour and usually those fees will come out to like, because we have to meet with attorneys and I usually have to have a fight with law enforcement because they're jerks Yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's so bizarre. It's bizarre to me. I, I say that a lot on my, uh, a lot of my content. I prosecute and I prosecuted for a while. So I really know. I have like a, I, I've had the most bizarre rejections on subpoenas and stuff. I'm like, why you obviously just start being a jerk. Um, anyway, do process my, but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I say, uh, I think 1500 to 2500 if I'm taking an actual legal case where it's going to go to court. So let me ask, listen, kind of, you said something earlier about the types of cases. Now that is finding someone. So if you, know, you can say as much as you want to about it, but get what, what is one of the cases that you remember that really tugged? Now, we, we try not to get emotionally involved in our cases. I, I'm course. guessing you don't because that will cloud your judgment. You just want to get to the facts and find the answer without having any other things kind of cloud you. So what's some of the things, one of the cases that maybe you felt really bad for the person uh and you was happy to help them. And maybe you didn't care if they paid you the rest of the money that they owed you because they were maybe in the right, according to what you believe, or that they were just so sympathetic and that you felt good about helping them. Hmm. Um, I had, I had a particular case where it was criminal defense and I, I think when I was doing criminal defense, the, the reason that I liked that line of work was because I felt like a lot of people, more than you would expect, are that the, the, the charges don't match what actually happened. Yeah. Uh, and no one ever gets to tell their side publicly. It's public opinions already happen when you get charged. Uh, and there was a family that got destroyed uh, before 
any pretrial even happened because the DA's office, I suspect, leaked some of the court documents ahead of time to the news. And so they annihilated them in the in the in the news. So I was already aware of the case even before they came to me. Um, and they were being alleged to have orchestrated millions of dollars of money laundering through a fencing scheme with catalytic converters. And I met the 22 year old who was head of operations. He was a good kid. He was probably not that bright. And that was get what was probably going to be his issue in court because with fencing, it's strict liability. Um, and especially with catalytic converters, it doesn't matter if you didn't know, you didn't document it. Um, and I was going through the evidence in my initial consult with him. And I noticed that the accounting records that he gave me for his business that he was paying taxes on, again, he didn't really seem bright enough to be like a schemer, but <laughs> It, you got to be a certain. You got to be on a certain level of bright to really scheme. <laughs> yeah, especially in this industry, which is heavily regulated, to get to the million dollar range. Like catalytic converters are expensive, but we're not talking tens of thousands per transaction. We're talking like seven hundred fifty to fifteen hundred per transaction. You got to do a thousand of them to make a million. Just for everybody out there, those catalytic converters are those things that are those pollution control devices that are placed underneath a car, right? They're high value because they have in embedded in them rare metals. So people will steal them off your car and sell them for the parts. Um, and so it was alleged more specifically against this consumer that, or, or this client that they were taking stolen catalytic converters knowingly and then reselling them for scrap, uh, which is a crime. It's a felony. Um, so many, many felonies on that case. The problem was he had only reported a hundred thousand dollars in revenue for his business in its lifetime. <laughs> and they're saying he had laundered like three million dollars, which is I mean, I know money laundering, you're not gonna report everything on your taxes, but not like that massive discrepancy. The IRS would already be on his doorstep. Um and yeah, so anyway, I, I believe that he was maybe guilty of something but not guilty of what he was charged of. So because he was dim-witted, maybe? Yes, a lot of the innocent people, unfortunately, are there of their own poor planning. When I when I prosecuted, I, I had two types of people, criminals and knuckleheads. <laughs> yeah. Most people were in the knucklehead. They weren't bad people. They weren't mean people. They were poor, they were uneducated, <clears throat> they were surrounded by people just like them, and they just stepped their foot in a pile of crap and they didn't know how to get out of it. A hundred percent. And and you just feel bad for, for people like that. So this this guy with the catalytic converter meet that kind of criteria? Yeah, and, and then I, I took the case and you know, I was very flexible on payment with that guy, but um, you know, we get discovery back and they just have a pile of police reports that were unsolved, Ugh. which was weird to me because they never explained how the police report got to the suspect. They just, we have all these unsolved cases of catalytic converter thefts in his area. Oh, I'm like, they piled on. How does that, how did uh, that guy right there arrest him? <laughs> and, and, and never mind the fact that's, and never mind the fact that those things are often stole by lots of people. A hundred percent. There was one guy who said, I know where you can sell this and recommended this guy's shop, but that doesn't mean, or actually he didn't even recommend the shop. He represented one of his employees. Like you should talk to him. He can get, get that sold. Hmm. To me, it didn't like, even if he had received two or three stolen catalytic converters to go in and, and convey in a open, uh, I guess it's not an indictment. It would have been an information that he had laundered millions of dollars they were hitting him with the felony charges for the laundry. Yeah. And that's why I was like, you know, you might get him on fencing because maybe, he, maybe he's, he's dimwit enough that fencing is a low standard. Maybe you got him for that, but he didn't launder money. And so when I went through his financial records. There was a vendor that was, he was selling scrap to that was committing probably, I should say, probably committing tax fraud. No, not a, not a scrap, not a junkyard guy. No, well, it wasn't, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the client. He, it was a vendor and the client doesn't have the education to go through the financial records. I'm like, this is not, this doesn't work. They don't, 
But, you know, once you get something sensationalized in the news, their business, their business got shut down. Politicians and cops and everybody piles on and, and, you know, and they can get rid of their docket. They can get rid of all the unsolved catalytic converters in the area and feel good about it. My, my report on that case was mostly focused on that, um, the lack of connection of suspect to the actual crime. And then also they had just arrested and convicted someone for for the actual theft of many mil, like not millions sorry many thousands of dollars worth of catalytic converters and that he was taking them out of state not to the not to the client's property so like you don't know how you've uh, properly accounted for these millions of dollars that you claim was being taken out of utah yeah so did the guy go to jail uh yes he's he's still there I'll be darn. Unfortunately. But, you know, it, I, I, I didn't get to stay for the whole duration of the case because my work is very pre-trial. Um, and I think they took it to, they're going to take it to trial. But, yeah, it was unfortunate because I think he had to, he, he was having trouble paying for an attorney. So on the other end of the spectrum, does a case pop to your mind where you were just, you would have, you would have done your work for free just to see that person get what they deserved. I've had a lot of kids yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone stick out that you're like, by God, you know, you're glad that this person got hosed? Well, I never see the outcome. I just, to me, it's like, I want to make, when I say like, I want to make, see, make sure they get hosed, I want to make sure that this is done properly because I don't want them to walk on a technicality. Yeah. Okay. So if you're a criminal defense attorney, you say you want to make sure that the state jumps through every hoop they're supposed to jump through. Absolutely. Or in some cases when it was, when I was doing business law uh, investigations, it was, I don't want any of this to be contested. I want, I want this to just stand on its own and it speaks for itself. And that's a good job. If you can do that, you've done a really good job. I've had a couple where we submit the expert report and then they settle like three days later. <laughs> I, and that's wonderful. Yeah, that yeah. shows you've done a hell of a job. Yeah. But one particular case, um, I had one particular case that really angered me because the cons the client still, I don't want to keep saying consumer, the client still lost. Uh, and I don't really understand why. So we, I had a, a, a military veteran who was living kind of on the North side of Utah. And I'm going to call cash County's prosecutor's office out because they, it was the most abominable job I've ever seen in an investigation. Um, but what happened was, he was going to school out there. He's disabled. He was just kind of out on a trip up Logan Canyon, which is a beautiful area. It's cougar country, beautiful area that time of year. And you're not talking. You're not talking about. You're not talking about old women cougars, right? Nope, nope. We're definitely talking about the the, the nasty ones that bite. Well, <laughs> okay. uh, you just know what I mean. The clear. cats. <laughs> just just um, want to be clear, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's cougar country. Uh, he was out on his four wheeler. You can get some country, you know, country energy out here in Utah on his four wheeler out in the Canyon late at night, looking at the stars, finds a, an abandoned dog tied to a fence post, hungry, covered in feces. So what does he do? There's no food out there. He takes the dog. He gets it nice and dressed up and takes it to animal control. Felony larceny. They charged him with felony larceny because the oh, dog no. was worth two thousand dollars because it was a herding dog, and he turned into oh. animal control. So it was a whole thing because I read the police report. They never spoke to the owner, and when you don't speak to the owner in a theft case, you cannot prove unauthorized possession. <laughs> yeah, how do you not do that? I don't know. That seems pretty basic law enforcement work to me, Cash County. But anyway, there was that. They 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 put in the report. And I, I almost quote, this is a very minimal paraphrase of, I called every shelter in the valley. <laughs> what, sh what, sh what shelters did you call? Who did you speak to? What did you ask them? They had no recordings of these calls. He just said, I called every shelter and he had not been to any of them. And I called a shelter and they said, no, he definitely came in. Um, I was like, the, 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 the police work was shoddy. So what I did was I, I asked the attorney to issue a subpoena to the law enforcement office to request all documents that would support who they called, to all the recordings of these calls, to uh, subpoena who the owner of the dog was because it wasn't even in the police report and who they spoke and when they spoke with the uh, the the, uh, the dog owner, which they never did. Um, it's just subpoena for records. 
just send it and then have the police officer stand in court and say, we don't have these records. We cannot respond to your subpoena because I didn't actually do my job. I want him to do that. And the attorney agreed. <laughs> <laughs> we got a very nasty phone call from the DA's office. And they were not happy that we embarrassed them. But uh, he took a PIA. He took a plea in abeyance, which is basically a, I plead guilt for the viewers, I guess I plead guilty as long, but you know, you're going to dismiss this after a certain amount of time. We call it here like a diversion. So you're going to uh, plead, you're, you're, they're going to do what you maybe some kind of recompense somehow. And then after a period of time, if you don't get any more trouble, they're going to dismiss it. Yes, that's exactly what they agreed to. I was frustrated because I thought he needed a full acquittal. And he had a friend that was with him that also got charged. Well, his lawyer probably told him to take the deal. Yeah, I mean, I know, but the, the inner justice in me was like, no, you need an acquittal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if, if I'm lawyer in that case, I would say, listen, man, I can beat this. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's that guy's ass on the line, you know, where or not he goes to jail. I would always say, Telling you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just like, man, roll the dice. We can do it, but it's risky. Well, another thing was that same DA charged a friend of his who was present at the time with felony appropriation, which is not the same as felony larceny. There's like some subtle differences. And I was kind of like, why are we charging this one with larceny and this one with appropriation if you're admitting in one case that you knew he had intent to return the dog? Yeah, it's, it's nuts. It doesn't make sense a lot of times. Yeah, but you know what? felony is so serious and people it ruins lives to get a felony like why would you he's a he's a disabled veteran you're gonna charge him with a felony oh be makes me mad. <laughs> like, that was my <laughs> um let me let me ask so when you if you were writing a book if you were writing a book give me two things so this is a two-parter two things i'm telling it to you up front so that way i don't forget <laughs> Two things that people do that later on can get them in trouble that maybe they're not even aware of uh, with an investigator. And then two things that, so it's kind of the same, two things that people can do to prevent themselves from getting in trouble later on, just to keep keeping their nose clean or tr cover their tracks or two things that you would recommend people do to kind of keep a clean record because, you know, you're open source and all of that. So, you know, what, what kind of mistakes people make to avail themselves of those processes. So what could I do at the back end or maybe at the front end to prevent someone from picking through my stuff? Um, don't piss anyone off ever for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's, the the oh thing is, you, there's always the, like, it's the, the, ty the types of things that people want looked into can be so broad and the relationship so minimal and a lot of that comes back to keeping your nose clean from my experience has less to do with following the law and more to do with not standing out and not pissing people off because people will find something wrong if you piss off the cop in the traffic stop he will find a reason to charge you and now you're in court and now you got to pay an attorney now you got costs just be nice and keep, keep it's not keep your nose clean it's keep your nose to the ground it, when you when you pop your head up people take shot at you i tell people all the time work hard keep your head down i had a judge just as an aside i had a judge it's a family court judge on all family court judges hate litigants that argue which is bizarre to me <laughs> i don't understand it so i would tell my clients exclusively when you see him when you go in there do not look at him. Do not look at his eyes because he would interpret things that weren't there. And he would get like, you rolled your eyes, you you blinked too much or whatever. I would say, keep your head down. Just keep your head down when you talk to him. So, so, but I also tell people generally, keep your head down, work hard. Don't poke your head up, especially when you get famous or when you get money. When you get money, if you keep your head up, people will shoot at you. Because they can get a judgment against you. <laughs> yeah. You can pay it. Yeah. So two things, give me two things that people do, but maybe by accident. Anytime you interact with the government, you are creating a record it's, it, I mean, if you ever watch a 2020 true crime, I mean, the guy committed murder, he's about to get away with it. 
his uh, rear taillight is out. He's getting pulled over. That is where I catch most people. Actually, when I when people are like, I cannot get good service, and I'm trying to find this guy who's dodging me. The first thing I'm going to do is he was doing five over somewhere. Everyone, it's everyone's doing five over no somewhere, kidding. and so I go and I find the speeding ticket. The officer grabs the license. They are going to serve the citation for that speeding ticket, and I'm going to get the address they served it to, and we're going to serve them there. I'll be darn. So, and that, that's successful like eighty percent of the time. It's common everyday stumbles Whoopsies. through life that make you open to other things later on that you never even thought about. A hundred percent. And if if it's the government you're running from, anytime you interact with a private company that can be subpoenaed, <laughs> then you're at risk. So, so digitally, and as, as we move forward in, in the information age and all of this stuff, and now we're looking at uh, AI and all of that, um, gone are the days. So gone are the days when you could hide. You could turn into a ghost. Those days are gone, right? Oh, yeah. You know, I, there's ways to do it, but it is way harder now. I think um, possession is nine-tenths of the law. And whoever possesses the information that we need, if it's the government, we're going to get it. You know, if, you're, if you have a driver's license, most people do. Depending on the state, it's obtainable by private investigators. We can go down the DMV, pay $100 to run your driver's license, just like a cop could. And we can figure out where, where you live. We can also file requests with the postmaster's office to figure out where you're forwarding your mail, um, to request the ownership of a P.O. box. Back before things were online, now there's still some counties, believe it or not, and I, I work in one of them, West Virginia or state. I work in West Virginia. They don't have their counties linked up into a cohesive unit where you can search the databases for someone's name to see if they've been involved with a, a criminal action. Kentucky does. You can run. I have access to a portal where I can run someone's name and find out if they've got any action at all, whether it's civil or criminal. So years ago, before they did all this, say 20 years ago, there were some judges that got in trouble because they had their... <laughs> They had their own sleeping docket, which it was a file, regular paper file in their drawer. And it would never come up for docket again unless you made that judge mad. Unless you didn't, you, maybe you, your family voted the wrong way. Then the file would magically find its way to the docket again. That was done routinely. You know, cases would disappear, you know, and like you said, but the technology was different. So whoever's in charge of the information, whoever has the information has the upper hand, you know, so. A hundred percent. And, you know, I've had cases where I was pretty sure the guy was in a tent somewhere trying because he knew that <laughs> he knew that the moment he got found, he was in a deep pile of shit. Well, you know what we do is he has family, unfortunately, nearby, and he's eventually going to want to meet with them for their birthday. And I will, I'm a very patient investigator, you see. <laughs> no. You see, in the state of Utah, they don't regulate where we, where and when we serve you as long as I'm not breaking the law inherently by, by doing it. So if I'm serving you at 3 a.m. because I'm knocking on your door, I will do that. If I'm serving you at your place of work in front of your coworkers at Thanksgiving dinner, I, I'll serve you if whenever If you get I need a to. real asshole, mm -hmm. that's the best. I had clients who on the other side of a case I detested. I would tell my process server, I want you to do this at work. A hundred percent. I, I had one guy I couldn't find and he was a piano teacher. So I went to the place where he worked cause his photo was on the website. So I just went when I assumed he would be there. <laughs> um, and he was there and I served him and then he was telling me all about how you can't legally serve me in my place of work. And I'm just like, you don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, you can't, don't you ever come back here? I said, if you are to be served a document, I will be back here and I will serve you again right here. Just so you know, this is, you're being, you're getting a divorce. And I served him from his students, which probably wasn't cool, but I couldn't find him. <laughs> no, but I would tell you, and, and one better than that. And I had a guy who I just truly despised. So I asked my friend who's a process server. I said, listen, I want him served at, I want him served at work, but I want him served on a holiday. So I picked a holiday. Um, it was Valentine's Day, believe it or not. Nice. Had him served <laughs> on Valentine's Day at his work because I wanted him to to believe that 
I was his Valentine. I could see and, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Served him, and I served people like before they left for Thanksgiving and at their home on Thanksgiving, at their home on Christmas, because they were truly despicable people. And, you know, that's probably, I, I, I took the low road on that, I'm sure. But, you know, there were such bad people that well, I thought they deserved it. Yeah, and I had, a, I had a criminal defense attorney that needed me to serve something urgent because he, maybe he didn't plan well for the deadlines for trial. So he, he needed me <laughs> to serve, serve a witness. He needed a witness who served as volunteer security at a, an event that was hosted two years ago. What can you tell me about this guy? I don't know what his name is. I don't know what he looks like. He was just like a Latino guy who was like in security two years ago at this event. I look up the event. It was a Mexican rodeo in West Valley, which is a heavily Latino populous area. Cool. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so I got him though. I got him served and it took 24 hours and I found him, called the city, figured out who organized the event, called the event coordinator, said, hey, who ran your security? And then they gave me the head of security and I served him. and. I, and I served him and his like security organization and all their like everyone basically we'll just get everyone in here and you're all going to show up and then we're only going to ask that one guy to speak but because you made this difficult <laughs> we'll serve everyone but yeah no and we we found him tracked him down I was like oh whew. anyway that's why that's why that attorney comes to me because I'll do the urgent pro pro process servers if I didn't I didn't plan well. Well, and, you know, you char you charge more for that too, right? If it's if yes, it's, I did. If their hair's on fire, the fee goes up. If I have to spend my entire day, sometimes in very dire circumstances, I talk about it. not 150 an hour, but you'll bill. I'll bill by the hour on this one. <laughs> You've devoted uh, several of your TikToks and stuff on cyberbullying, right? Yeah, or uh, I think some people will term it gang stalking. I don't know if that's the appropriate gang term. Gang stalking. That was it. That, so when I'm scrolling through, I saw you and it was gang stalking. I thought, man, I have never heard this before. So I kept, I watched um, probably everything you've got on it. And so tell, tell everybody what that is, because that seems to be a fairly popular topic. Absolutely. I, you know, I think it's a term that um, many people use that has different definitions in different contexts. You know, one of those things where no one has a defined definition, which is part of the problem. Um, so gang stalking, as I've kind of come to understand it, and I've taken cases from people who had the complaint, and we've, you know, I've seen it firsthand. Gang stalking is kind of the complaint that people feel like they're being followed. And the natural thing in the legal services, because it's a common, a lot of my colleagues have received those complaints, both private investigators and attorneys. Like, what do we do with this? Like, there's not really any evidence to go off of. He's probably paranoid. Um, and honestly, a lot of people are. It's, it's, it's one thing that you have to navigate in private investigations is making sure you don't take those kinds of cases but well my my message is on my message is on my you know i i advertise you know to try to help people figure out some problems they might have and and i would say probably one of my top three issues are people feeling like and i can tell the longer the message is the more cuckoo i think they are if they're giving me a whole crap ton of information yeah. and it's out there so i get a lot of that and People are following, people are, you know, harassing them and, and there's all these really weird reasons. So is that what you're talking about? A hundred percent. And I really think these cases fall into three different buckets and everyone's describing all three buckets as gang stalking. And I just, I don't really feel like that's appropriate, but I'm not like any central authority by any means. I've met cl uh, clients or, or, or even prospects that they're in engaged in drug dealing. They're engaged in adult entertainment. They're engaged in something that is high risk body shop work, like which is a cliche almost. And they're like, I, I did this thing and it was like super illegal. And now I feel like I'm being followed by somebody. Who do you think it is? I'm like, it's probably <laughs> could be a thousand people, <laughs> probably every law enforcement agency that would have jurisdiction. <laughs> and um, well, I need you to make it stop. I, I can't like you're going to they're going to do their investigation. If you did something, you're going to get charged. That's that's just part of the process. I can't, like, you can confront them if you want, but like, I, I can't do anything to change that. Then there's another bucket of people, people that said 15 years ago on a 
bright Tuesday afternoon, this really random thing happened. And now three years later, I had the vision and now I'm being followed by um, the Illuminati. And that's like really out of left field. There's a lot of like vision and a divination. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm not going to take that case. They need to take another shot of Thorazine or some Haldol or something. Yes. I, I try to like, I'll hear their case out sometimes and be like, look, that's not even feasible. Like that's not how investigations work. People are not omniscient. And I think a lot of the issues with people who mean well is they don't understand the resources available to investigators. And they kind of assume that we know everything all the time and that we just have magical access to people's address. Like, you're oh, Jesus. You're next, no. you're next to Jesus. There, there's no one that has the resources to know to do that. It's not – if they did, like, could you imagine how much more efficient the government would operate? I'm not saying that that's what should happen, but, I mean, it's it's inefficient partially because they can't find people because they, they're terrible at it. Um, but – and then the third bucket is people who have a legitimate concern. They live in small towns, Bible belts heavy. They said something really nasty to the wrong guy which is my whole keep your nose to the ground. And now that guy went and spread a rumor and now they probably have to move like that. That's really what that outcome is going to be. I, I can't, I can't provide anything for you, but I can try, try to like help you better understand the situation. I can kind of do some digital searches, but like. Now these people are not like the second bucket of people. These people aren't really crazy. They just got themselves in a pile of crap because you know, Someone probably is hunting them down or following them or making their life uncomfortable, I guess. A hundred percent. I think I think there's a lot of evidence for it. They can point to a specific court action and they can point to a specific person they pissed off. I'm like, well, it sounds like you know what the problem is. But um, then they want – and again, again, the request is often, can you make it stop? And I don't know what – like private investigators in general – don't do like they can't make things happen i can produce the evidence and you need to get an attorney he will make things happen i will give him the weapons but that's about it yeah they can file charges criminal charges and all of that yeah i've, I've had some be really upset that i wouldn't represent them in court and i just i can't do that <laughs> so that that term gang stalking is that so when i is that more than one person or more than one agency or is that more than is is that like what that means i know we don't have a real definition you said but is that what that means when you say gang stalking more than one individual well i think i think people i think people suspect it's a it's a group of people oh, okay but in my experience um but a being the person doing the stalking not like it for any government agency, but just like with insurance work, which is super common. Can I just say insurance is constantly having people out there following other people for to do claims verification. It ha it's happening every day and you will never know that it happened to you. But and, the, and investigators can also in insurance work um, follow the wrong person. I've done it. I mean, they, they, the, the description they give us is so broad. It's like white male with brown hair who's maybe in somewhere between five and six feet. And so if you look kind of like the guy, you might get followed and that's just not your fault. Well, so there's that thing, if you're paranoid, that doesn't necessarily mean no one's really following you. <laughs> exactly. But if someone's really following you, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in danger. Exactly. Of course, okay. if you feel like you're in danger, you should always do everything you can to maintain your safety. But if you feel like you're being followed every day, there's probably a component of that that's paranoia because law enforcement agencies do not follow you every day. And I tell people they got more things to do. To put it into perspective, like professional follow people around people, we're talking about billing $1,500 per day to follow you. You are not pro probably not worth $1,500 per day unless you're committing a massive felony and then it's a government agency and that's a whole other problem. <laughs> and they're only going to follow you on specific days when they think you're going to do something relevant. They're not just like, Hey, he's it's, it's another Tuesday time to follow Jeff. Like now they, they're going to wait for something ha to happen and then they're going to follow you. That reminds me, I had a client once and he was so despicable. He had slept with his son's wife, just a despicable human being. This old, he was an old <sighs> decrepit old man. And he, he used pills to apply her and, and she was, uh, you know, addicted. And I told him, I said, Kevin, every day you wake up and your dad, uh, oh, oh, no, I told his dad, I said, dad, 
every day you wake up and Kevin does not whip your ass, you ought to be lucky. You know, because you've certainly done enough to deserve it. Because he would come to my office and say, Kevin won't leave me alone. I'm like, well, Kevin's got, you got reason to believe Kevin ain't leaving you alone. You know, if, if I was Kevin, I would put on my to-do list, wake up, put my pants on, brush my teeth, whip my dad's ass. That would be like what I would do. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so that first bucket of people got reason to believe if they're involved in some kind of criminal or underground black activity, then, you know, they got reason to believe there's something wrong. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I'm not saying government agencies don't do things that are unethical. They do all the time and it's, it's horrible, but, but, but the, the idea that, you know, civil rights actions are complicated, they're expensive and they're hard to win and they're you really hard win to win. Them. Like, so I, I, I generally like I've stopped taking these cases. I took a few because I kind of wanted to see what exactly was going on and I build very low, but I, I don't take them anymore because I just not like nine times out of 10, there's not much I'm going to be able to do about it. You should probably get an attorney if you really feel like there's something harassment is not a, in, in my state, at least is not a crime. Um, it's a, it's a civil action, so you can sue them, but you're, you're not going to get a criminal act. And they're like, I'm calling the FBI. I'm like, Oh. Or, or they'll send an email and they'll CC every government agency in the world on it. I'm like, <laughs> I'll tell you right now, the FBI front desk person that saw that you CC'd every other, it, straight to the delete folder. <laughs> okay. Listen, so I'm going to get wrap it up here a little bit. And so I kind of had to ask you, and before I forgot, one of the big reasons that got me on you was the cyberbullying or the gang stalking, which was very interesting. Um so tell people how they can find you, how they can look for more of your stuff. And if they're interested, I mean, my channel's growing, actually, we're getting some eyeballs. And so uh, just tell people, you know, how they can get hold of you and where they can find more of your stuff. Absolutely. Well, I post a TikTok, uh, you know, I, I haven't been doing as often. I'm going to try to pick that back up here pretty soon. But you find me keen eye P.I. Keen Eye Investigations is the name of the agency. Keen Eye PI is, is the TikTok handle. If you just throw Josh Private Investigator into Google, you might be able to find me that way too, Utah based. So, um, and, you know, I, I take consults at my phone number. It's, you know, I'm happy to provide that to you too. Um, and we, we schedule those usually ahead of time, but. I, I do. My consults are free. I, I'll, I'll give people 15 minutes of my time in the evening to talk about their case and just see if there's anything that would be of value. So good for you. Listen, man, I, I honestly appreciate it. I like what you've done and I'm true, truly fascinated. I, I don't have anybody. I don't I don't interview anybody that I'm not interested in what they do. And that I think gives value to people. Like I always say, I, I want people to have actionable information, stuff that they can use. Uh, if they ever need it, put it in their tool belt and use it later. Uh, so I'm, I'm just really thankful that you agreed to talk to me first on phone and then that you're here. And I do appreciate it. And so I want to I want to thank you just uh, again for uh, what you've done and been patient with my technology problems. So I, I really thank you. No, uh, you know, I really appreciate being brought on the show. It's, it's been nice talking with you, Eugene. I appreciate the opportunity. And I always let everybody know when life and law collide, as I say, when they collide in your world, and if you live long enough, by golly, they're going to collide. So when they collide in your world, as we say here in the 606, give me a holler. And, uh, We'll, we'll end with that, and I'll let my dad run us out of here if Katie cues it up. Turn me around, help me to the door. I'll never make it on my own. Turn me around.